Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Um, I am really excited by my guest today. I will let him introduce himself, but he's somebody that I've been aware of in the community for quite some time. And I've actually mentioned his channel probably the last two or three different live streams that I've been doing. Uh, I think he's got a really uh, interesting take on A Song of Ice and Fire, lots of really original ideas. And I think you're gonna really enjoy uh, the discussion we're about to have, but I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Robert. I was aware I was popping in and out of those live streams and people I, like it would be on the sidebar and all of a sudden it would turn orange with mentions. I'm like, all right, so something just happened. Some people just mentioned me, probably Robert, and I had to go back and watch the replays. Uh, but yeah, I am Joe Magician. Uh, I, am, I have my own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Joe Magician. I'm also a moderator for the Song of Ice and Fire board and a feature writer for Watchers on the Wall and a co-host of Maester Monthly, so that's all the titles. <laughs> um, fantastic. Well, it's a delight to have you on here. As I, uh, I'm i very aware whenever I'm, I'm on YouTube is that uh, the YouTube community within A Song of Ice and Fire is actually relatively new. There are communities that have been around, uh, particularly like the Reddit community, for a lot longer than that, and I think there's a huge amount of uh, of knowledge and understanding of the books in particular that we can get from there. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, guys, just before we start, I did just want to say, if you're watching this live, uh, it came up in the chat a couple of times. Um, there was scheduled to be at the same time uh, a live stream from uh, two of my favorite uh, YouTubers uh, who are Order of the Green Hand and LML. They were going to be doing a collaboration at this same time. They rather magnanimously and without me asking, uh, changed the time. So that uh, if anyone was wanting to watch both of these, uh, they could do so. So guys, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, to them. Uh, they too are original thinkers within this uh, within this community, and I really value. I've had both of them on here uh, uh, before, um, and I'm sure I will again. Uh, they are rescheduling to next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time, and I would highly recommend. That's going to be on the Order of the Green Hands channel. I would highly recommend you go and check that out. I'll mention that again a bit later, but guys. Thank you. I really appreciated that. The subject today, though, is um, uh, Robert Baratheon and Ned Stark. Now, uh, these are two absolutely central characters in book one and and season one, obviously, and also in the sort of the background and history that we've got going, uh, sort of the builds up to the story. So uh, I asked my patrons um, uh, for some questions, so we got some of them to come to, uh, and also always uh, will be coming out to questions in the chat. Talking of which, Maura Lee, thank you so much for that super chat just before we even started. That's incredibly generous and some lovely words as well. Thank you. You know how much I appreciate your support. Um, but uh, why don't we just start? Um, uh, shall I call you Joe? You can call me Joe. It's fine. Okay, we'll call you. We'll call you Joe. So just for on uh, brand. <laughs> why don't we give you the, uh, the 30 second? What's the 30 second version of how did Ned and Robert become together as good friends to start with? Where, where, what's the backstory there? So the 30 second version, which I can relate to you all because I was uh, cramming Radio Westeros today and earlier this week because they have such amazing information on Ned and Robert. You guys should all go watch that, by the way. Um, basically what happened was in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, most of the Lords Paramount ended up fighting there, including the Lords uh, Baratheon, Aaron, and Stark ended up friends, and they decided as a group to foster their sons with each other. John Aaron uh, did not have uh, any kids until Robert Aaron, I think, or some of them died. So he ended up taking Robert and Ned into his fostership. Uh, Robert after Stefan Baratheon died, and Ned, just because he was the second son, Brandon got the full Northern experience. And from be being raised together from a relatively young age, uh, early teens, they ended up best bros forever. Fantastic, excellent summary there. So I think the the, the first point in this sort of comes from uh, a question from one of my patrons, Pegleg Pete, who is asking about the character and this, this kind of history that they've got the two of them, if they're both up there in the Eyrie. Um, uh, he says, please go into depth about their youth. Robert has always struck me as a friend who starts the bar fight nine times out of ten. <laughs> uh, and I go drinking with him. Ned always seems a lot quieter in everything he did. He does not only finishes the fight, but also gets his friend home afterwards. I think that's quite a good 
summary there. Um, so I think the, the the starting point is these are two different characters. What what is it that uh, that we think gels them together? Why is it that these two and we know that they were good friends? What is it do you think that actually gels these two characters together? Hmm. Well, one thing is just being raised together tends to make friends of people that normally wouldn't. That's the whole point of. Uh, well, it's a large point of high school and college. It's to meet people you normally wouldn't. That's kind of what happened with these two. They were allowed to become friends despite being hundreds of miles apart. So that's one thing. It's relatively isolated in the Erie. So got to make friends with whoever's there probably or else you're going to have a real rough time up that mountain. Um, and I think the most important part of their friendship is that um, each one resembles the other's brother. Ned is very similar to Stannis in terms of their temperament their values and just their sort of demeanor and the same can be said of robert and brandon stark the two robert and brandon i argued this in my um my video about the wild wolves trying to find brandon stark's bastards i use robert as a template because they are extremely similar seeing robert as a as a king is probably what brandon would have been as a lord later in life so for these two people uh, for Ned and Robert, meeting each other was kind of like meeting their brothers again, but in a much out, outside of their house dynamics and in a new place. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm already getting a, a sneaky feeling that we're going to have a lot of conversation like this where you say stuff and then I just completely agree with you. Um, <laughs> uh, those were pretty much the exact points I was going to make. It, it, when I was doing my traveler's guide to the Erie, it, what really struck me was quite how how isolating that place is it's mm. not a big castle it's quite a small castle and so if you're there um uh, as you know as as a as a young lad uh, you would look around who is it that can actually be my friend and there's actually a limited stock of people they couldn't just nip down it, it takes a day to go down from the area and a day to go back up and it's not an easy journey so you spend most of your time with this small group of people so yes there was that bonding experience and I think that was a fantastic point about that they resemble each other's brothers they felt they felt they understood the other person straight mm -hmm. away, I would have thought. And so that, I think there was something going on there. Um, I am going to uh, drop in uh, early on here because I know this is something that uh, that you were talking to me about before. I've not had any specific questions on this, but um, uh, it's something that I've seen before as hints. Uh, do you think that there is more to their relationship than just friendship? Um, and the sort of the line that I will give you as the kind of the feed-in line is yep. in book one, we get uh, Robert talk, says to Ned, we were more than brothers. Mm -hmm. And that is a really quite strong, because you have to say, what does this mean more than brother? Because they were clearly friends. And it's one thing for friends to say, you're my brother. But to say you're more than my brother implies something else. What, do you think there's anything extra going on here? <sighs> Um, this has been a long running joke that I enjoy telling, um, but it's one that usually resonates because there's probably a hint of truth to it in that when I think you can see it most directly in Robert's relationship with Liana, Ned tells him, you didn't know Liana. You didn't like, why are you so, he's basically confused why Robert is so upset about Liana absconding with Rhaegar or whatever really happened. But he blatantly tells him, you didn't really know him. You didn't really know her. And it becomes clear that Robert, and I think he actually says this, he wanted to marry Liana because he wanted to be to be Ned's blood. He wanted to be more than his brother. <laughs> he wanted to be a Stark too. And that's kind of an, I think that's kind of emblematic of their relationship, especially when they were younger. Now, I made a joke on Reddit. <laughs> Uh, a few weeks ago that made it made it into Maester Monthly because I wasn't on this thing. And it was a post uh, talking about Robert Littlefinger and their manic pixie dream girls, which is basically the idolized <laughs> women that um, way out of proportion Robert did with Liana, Littlefinger does with Kat. And what, one of the top posts was by Bale Bard and they were talking about Ned and Robert. And I made the joke, does that make Ned Robert's manic pixie dream girl? And it started this whole big conversation and people actually started taking it seriously. And I was actually impressed by what I saw. Um, for instance, Robert, do you know the description of Robert's physique when he was younger? What, do you know the famous line? 
Well, I think it's just appeared in, in the chat. Muscled like a maiden's fantasy. Do you know whose POV that comes from? Uh, I think this is probably from Ned's. It's Ned's. It's Ned's. Ned is the only character who really comments on Robert's attractiveness. He calls him <laughs> as muscled as maiden's fantasy. That's kind of weird. When they meet, Ro Ned actually comments that Robert's gone fat, which is weird that he's noticing. Like, it's a continuation of this weird thing. And then um, there's also the fact that from in all of Ned's internal POV, he has no sexual thoughts about anybody. He doesn't really about Catalan. He doesn't even Cersei when she tries to come on to him. He just kind of brushes it off, just kind of like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But he he doesn't he doesn't really take it seriously. There's like no imagination. There's no like, what what if I actually did have sex with Cersei? And it's this sort of odd odd continuation of events in quotes where it's kind of suggested that Ned is way more interested in Robert than he may be in any female he's ever met. And actually Robert comments on that where he says, Ned, I've never even seen you like into a girl. It's like, yeah, you're right. Ned really hasn't except for Rashara Dane. And even that Brandon had to do the introduction because Ned was too shy. Well, maybe he was too shy. Maybe he wasn't interested. That kind of thing. A shower was the prettiest girl at the party, after all. Yeah, exactly. And I think so. I I kind of like this theory, and another <laughs> part of me kind of doesn't. Yeah. Um, I I think that it's uh, it's very clear that they were they were close, the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, the the language they use um, about them seems very close. I think it's also very clear that Ned doesn't seem to have the same high sex drive that uh, many other characters, including yeah. Robert Baratheon, seem to have. He he doesn't think about things in quite that way. He thinks about things in quite an abstract way when he thinks about Rhaegar. Doesn't seem the type to go off to brothels. He's all, and it's yeah. almost like a, uh, just he, he doesn't see these things in a personal way. It's just he's observing things. Um, so there's certainly, uh, there's certainly something going on there. Whether I would go as far as to say that there was a, a relationship or whether it was just a crush, um, I'm not entirely sure. But what it's it's I think one of these things that George R. R. Martin has left deliberately vague, a few little dangled hints that maybe we can see something more there. But the takeaway point is that they were close and they viewed themselves as being close, not just like brothers, but something more than that, something uh, lasting that's not just an accident of who they happened to be um, related to, but about a, a real kindred spirit going on there. So that's the starting point for their their relationship, as it were. Um, and I, I kind of liked the the analogy. We were talking briefly before we went on air. You were talking about the analogy of, say, Spartan warriors when yeah. sometimes they were kind of pair up the two of them um, and they have a real strong bond between two particular fighters. So um, that's, that's where I would come at from that. I, I think, to my mind, Robert Baratheon pretty clearly isn't gay or exclusively gay um he has in my view far too many um bastard children to be to to make that likely uh so um uh, there's another layer there but sure. i don't think it's is quite as uh, as pun intended quite as straightforward as, <laughs> as we might uh, as we might think um okay let's let's take on that and build that uh, build on that uh, with uh, another question coming in from one of my patrons um, this uh, is to uh, still in this time when they're in the eerie uh, Natalie Donald asks was Ned happy about Robert and Leanna's betrothal even in his youth Robert was supposed to be promiscuous and he doesn't seem uh, like someone Ned would want for his only sister. So what, what do you what do you make of that? Do you think that Ned was happy about this or not? Oh, that takes on so many more layers now. Um, my initial response is that Ned was um, pleased that Robert would become his brother, but he was not pleased that Liana was very against it, that she told him so, that she knew that Robert would never stick to one bed. He already had Mia Stone in the veil. He was going to have more, much in the same way that um, we see from another character from the Vale, Harry the Heir, who had two kids before even being betrothed. Same sort of thing. Um, 
but maybe on a personal level, um, maybe there maybe there was like a little tinge of jealousy. Uh, I would I would compare the what we're talking about more to John Connington and Rhaegar, where there's a lot of affection, obviously coming from one side, but probably never anything happened. But Connington, from his POV, is clearly in love with Rhaegar, and maybe Ned was a little too, and. Maybe they both kind of added up, but the, Ned's way was not to rock the boat. His father had decreed that the marriage would happen, so he's dutiful. He goes along with it, even though I, even though from his POV, we knew that he thought it wasn't a, a great idea based on Liana's response. Yeah, so it seems to be a complex response on his part. He, Robert Baratheon clearly thought he wanted to marry her uh, and felt very strongly about that, and Ned... Uh, carried effectively, we don't know exactly how, but he took the, the marriage proposal to his father and one assumes, given that it was accepted, that he didn't say, never, don't, don't do this at all, this is a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. He must have passed it on with some kind of uh, uh, positive uh, mood music with it. Um, then we get uh, a reflection about when, as you say, when Liana um, uh, says to him, you know, he just he sleeps around um and ned seems to kind of try and defend his friend at that point and his default reaction isn't yeah i know uh, and it's not ideal for you i'll see what i can do about it he he just defends his friend and says you know what he'll change when when he's married you think people change uh, to which she says no they don't um and so at that point he actually seems slightly more loyal to his friend than to liana and as if he's actually wanting this marriage to happen so uh, i think although he may have had personal um uh, reservations about it i think that once it was there as you said i think that he felt on bound to support it because he was a loyal stark to doing what the starks had to be doing yeah he's the youngest son that Robert is the Lord of the Stormlands. Rickard is the Lord of the North. Ned doesn't have a, a lot of say in what's happening. I mean, maybe he can put in a word. Maybe he did try, but it was it's very clear from Rickard that his desire to make an alliance with the Baratheons at almost any cost was going to happen. Um, the fostering, the, the relationship going back to the Stepstones, the marriage between Brandon and Catelyn that was promised. He was doing this kind of no matter what, and you can, Ned could kind of be the fly in the ointment, or he could kind of get out of the way because this is where the winds were blowing. Seems pretty clear which way he went. Uh, I also wanted to um, just quickly clarify one point. Ned, um, I, I, we've been kind of joking around, or not really joking around, but taking it a little bit seriously, maybe there was more to the relationship between Robert and Ned. Ned may, may also just be asexual. It may not be like romantic love he just could not he just might not be interested in that kind of thing so he really likes robert so maybe that's his strongest affection while he doesn't particularly care about actually having any kind of sexual relationships yeah and i think uh i, I would agree with that I, it's it's a really interesting idea to explore because it's it's there's something there are hints here um but the short answer is we don't know Mm. Uh, don't know the exact relationship we don't have within ned's pov we don't have him going oh you know i really loved that man and i wish he was mine or anything we don't have that we just get a few little drops of hints here and there um and we also don't get any kind of idea about his sexuality at all it just doesn't come up which as you say might mean that he was asexual it might mean that he was bisexual we don't we don't we don't know. So I think the point here is that it's actually, it doesn't affect the story. And I think this is why we're not told it's not spelt out to us. I mm. like the, uh, there's a, um, a sort of a, a potential cross-reference across to, to Loras Tyrell and, um, and Renly Baratheon, uh, when obviously uh, Renly uh, gets engaged to Marjorie, uh, and that appears is just a way to get closer to his lover. So I, I like the fact that there's that as a kind of a model for this, but we don't know. And it doesn't affect the story going forward what the relationship was. We just need to know that it was a strong one, the two of mm. them completely tight together that 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 was what it was 
So uh, let's let's move on a little bit to um, uh, the the rebellion. Now, I didn't get a, any specific questions from my patrons on this one, but uh, I'd be interested in your take uh, to their different reactions to uh, to this rebellion. Do you think they were fighting different wars or fighting for different causes? Um, because we get uh, when I was going through my series of videos on this, it became very apparent to me that Robert Baratheon. Uh, yes, this was his character, but he just fought battle after battle after battle all the way across the continent. Um, uh, at the end of it, he's saying, I want to be king. Uh, and then Ned, long journey up north, long journey down south, and just focused in on the things that he has to do. He has to win this battle, then he has to win that battle, go and uh, get rid of the people at Storm's End, then find his sister. It seems very clinical, just doing the things. What? Uh, how would you kind of characterize their two different approaches to that war? Well, one thing in particular is from um, Ned's POVs that he bears Rhaegar no ill will. He he basically thinks of Rhaegar just kind of like as a person he knew, not in the way that Robert dreams of killing him every night. So Robert is very much um, motivated by getting back Lyanna, as well as, of course, Ares asking John Aaron to lop off his head and send it to King's Landing. Those two things are probably what motivated Robert. But Ned, um, it, that part of the war that Robert is probably the most interested in, I think you're right in saying that Ned wasn't really that upset about it. He may have thought at some point that... Um, perhaps Rhaegar would turn on Ares because there's hints at the tourney of Harrenhal that the, the point of the tourney was a great council that perhaps that was already, that was already in the works in a sense. So it may, for Ned, like it, he may not have even envisioned a total dethroning civil war. It may have just been get rid of Ares, put Rhaegar on the throne. We're good. And then whoops, Rhaegar shows up at the trident with the Royal army behind him, And Robert has made this, Robert and John have made this into a huge war. So at that point, there's no going back, but it seems mostly, I would say, self-defense from Ned. He just has to, his father and his brother are now dead by Aerys's hand. He He's now a criminal according to the realm and a traitor. So he kind of has to defend himself, even if he doesn't feel that strongly about the cause from the outset. Yeah, I'd agree completely. I think there's there's a difference here. So Ned, it's very much about it's it's actually quite a defensive war on his part. He's mm. seen his father, he's seen his his elder brother killed. He knows that if he'd gone to King's Landing, he'd have been killed too. Probably it would have been the wiping out of House Stark if um if if he just didn't go to war. So I think from his perspective, he had to get rid of Eris. That had to happen in order to save his family. And he obviously had to find his sister. And that was what he was about. Robert Baratheon, as we saw, particularly towards the end of the war, it was about wiping out the Targaryens. He didn't like Eris. Uh, Eris had done horrific things. He wanted to get rid of him. He hated Rhaegar. Uh, and the moment that you start going down that route, you go, well, okay, so are you going to let Rhaegar's children ascend to the throne, they would grow up knowing that Robert Baratheon killed their father and their grandfather. Are they, you really going to allow them to be kings? I don't think you can. So I think the, the Robert Baratheon just got into this mindset he had to get rid of all the Targaryens. So by the time they meet up, and let's not forget for most of the war, they were actually separate. Robert Baratheon charging across the south, Ned going up to the north and then back down again. Uh, by the time they met up, that was when Robert Baratheon, I think, has got to the point where he's saying, right, that's it. The only way to deal with this is to get rid of all the Targaryens. And I think that was when it really hit home with Ned, what Robert Baratheon had become and who he was as a person. Um, uh, I just want to take a quick moment just to say Higa Herga. Uh, thank you so much, uh, firstly, for letting me say your name again, because I do love saying Higa Herga. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for the super chat. No question tonight, just my usual cash. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, while we're on the uh, subject of super chats, we all had one other one just before we came on air um, from uh, Mike, uh, who was thinking about this uh, rebellion period uh, and was just wondering who we thought would win in a fight between rebellion era Ned and rebellion era Robert. And I think I'll, I'll start on this one and then throw over to you to see whether you would mm -hmm. agree. Um, my gut instinct is probably Robert. 
at that stage is he was uh, he was an immense figure. He we only see him in the show, uh, sort of like this slightly fatter, slower character, almost comical and and drunken most of the time. Um, but during the war, it's noticeable every single battle. The report is that he was at the center of the fight. He hunted down the the best fighters and the lords and the leaders of the the opposition and took them down one by one in personal combat and uh, he did that battle after battle after battle three battles in one day at summer hall um, <laughs> and, and it's just uh, he was an absolute beast and i think at that time he probably had the better of ned the thing about ned is that we actually very rarely see him in combat sure. and uh, we know he was good uh, he clearly survived the Tower of Joy. Um, I'll get onto that in my series of videos very soon, I promise you. Um, uh, and we also know that in the battle against uh, Jamie, the, or the fight against Jamie we saw on the show, um, there was a wonderful... Uh, if you watch that scene again, uh, I was talking about this um, uh, actually quite recently on the podcast, uh, the Watchers on the Wall podcast. The um, hmm. There's this two... Uh, shots of Jamie in that uh, when they come together. The first one, when he's fighting Ned, you see that Jamie's enjoying it. He's surprised that Ned's, Ned's actually quite a good fighter and he's enjoying it. And then about 10, 20 seconds later, he suddenly you get this changed look in his face where he get, he's, you see him actually going, hang on a moment, he's not just good, he's very good. And actually, I might be able to might might lose this. So uh, I think that was them showing that Ned is a very, very fine fighter. But for my money, at that time, Robert Baratheon was just a man apart. What's what's your take on that one? Uh, I would agree in single combat, Robert would crush him. Robert was six foot six. His warhammer was so huge that Ned tried to lift it and barely could, whereas Robert is swinging the thing around like, like it's a toy during battle. And like you say, he's at the center of battles. He's destroying people. He's like the true heir of someone like Lionel Bratty in the Laughing Storm, who also just one-on-one -on -one could destroy anybody. The only way Ned could win, and I don't know if he has this in him, is perhaps a Tower of Joy way, which is um, using advanced numbers or much in the way that Blood Raven killed Damon Blackfire. You don't kill him on the battlefield. You have to you have to kill him with by tricking him, by making him go somewhere he doesn't want to, and taking advantage of his bloodlust and his anger and his rage. That would probably be the only way maybe Ned has it in him. Doesn't seem like he's that kind of person like Blood Raven, though, that would set up a bunch of archers to kill everybody by killing I think it was his two sons, and then slayed Damon when he stopped to like mourn their instant deaths. I don't think Ned has that in him. But that probably might be how in one-on-one, -on -one, no way Ned wins, <laughs> even with ice. It, but actually, Ned never used ice in battle. It, no, uh, George, George said it's too big. Yeah, and and this this is actually this is one of the it's slight digression, but it's it's one of the uh, the things that people misunderstand about ice is that it is it's a ceremonial sword. It's mm. not it's not intended to be for for battle. It is incredibly tall and it's incredibly unwieldy, and you would have to be a giant to use it. Um, uh, at which point I'm sure LML would, uh, if I saw him in the chat <laughs> earlier, actually, I'm sure he would probably suggest some some crazy idea that a giant could wield it or has wielded it. But uh, I don't think he is in there in the chat anymore. So we'll we'll move on from that one. Um, OK, so uh, we've got the, the rebellion and then we get this falling out uh, at the end of the rebellion. We get this uh, the just after the Battle of the Trident, we have uh, the the sack of king's landing and we get tywin lannister who just beat ned to king's landing and he sends his guys in there we get the mountain and emery lorch they they go in and they brutally murder uh, elia and her two children rhaegar's pardon me rhaegar's children and uh, ned is horrified by this and then robert baratheon arrives and robert baratheon goes cool that's good. Well done. You've got rid of them. <laughs> Their dragon spawn don't like it at all. Uh, and while you're at it, uh, somebody really needs to go off and kill the other Targaryens that are hanging up in Dragonstone. And they have this huge argument, and Ned effectively storms off down to Storm's End appropriately. Um, 
So what do you think was going on there in the background? Was there was there anything else, another layer to that, or was that simply Ned just actually being quite human and thinking that killing children is a bad thing? Was there something else going on there? I just thinking about it now, this might actually go back quite a ways in the relationship. Uh, we mentioned Mia Stone, Robert's first child uh, early on in the stream. And it, I think it's Ned, I believe, that comments on it that while Robert was around Mia, he would he would play with her, he would treat her like a real daughter, and then as soon as she was out of sight, it was like she didn't exist. The same way that Robert treats um, women, where Ned Ned uh, has the line where um, his problem is that he makes promises and he always keeps them. Robert would tell a woman he loved them and then forget them as soon as as soon as he was done with them. He'd walk out of the room, everything's forgotten. And it seems uh, quite clear that Robert, and this hasn't, I don't think this has changed into a Game of Thrones, is a person of very little empathy for others. He's a, he's a very selfish person. He's very self-absorbed. A lot of his motivations are about him. Even his, um, his anger over Lyanna is not really about Lyanna. It's about Rhaegar taking his wife. Because he doesn't know Lyanna. So... I think in that sense, this is probably something that's been building most of their lives together. Ned constantly telling Robert, hey, remember like people exist. <laughs> There's other people than you, Robert Baratheon. And Robert just sort of being like, yeah, kind of, but like Stormlord, it's fine. I can do whatever I want. And this might just be the, the, the budding of the heads that finally happened, the thing that broke their relationship, which we know it basically did. Ned went north and basically never saw Robert again until he showed up in Winterfell. Just a complete, their philosophies is bouncing off each other in a very dramatic way. Yeah, I, and, and one of the things I'd like to sort of like have as a theme to this as sort of a takeaway point is the fact that we, we often look at the different moments that Robert and Ned are, are together in isolation, and we shouldn't do that. We should we should say, okay, so what happened there in King's Landing at that time? That reflects a lot of what's happened before between them. And then what happens when he's down in King's Landing again for the next time that we see in the books, that is a reflection of and a result of the previous things that have happened between the two of them. So, so this kind of relationship between the two of them builds over time. Um, the, the thing I would add to that, I think, is uh, in my view, um, and this is kind of spoiling my previous videos if you've not watched those ones yet on the Roberts Rebellion. Uh, so I think Benjen knew about what was going on with Rhaegar and Lyanna. And I think that Benjen probably, he was stuck up. Remember, he was the Stark up in Winterfell, so he wasn't involved in any of this war. Um, and he would have seen Lyanna disappear and then his father and eldest brother both be brutally murdered and then a civil war uh, happen. Uh, and then eventually Ned's going to turn up and, and Benjen, I think... At that point, he will be wracked with guilt that he knew something was going on, probably all the way back from the tourney at Harrenhal, and he said nothing because he would have been sworn to silence by Lyanna. And I think that he will have told Ned at that point, effectively, that this war was built on a lie. Now, that means that Ned is going there uh, into this war. Yes, he's a war he still has to fight, and he knows he's very Stark-like, and he's going to do his duty. He has to go off and win this war. But at the same time, he knows that when he finds Lyanna, there's a chance that she's going to be um, together with Rhaegar, closely associated with Rhaegar, perhaps even married, perhaps even with children. He doesn't know what's going on. But what he, what he sees, in my view, what he sees when he gets down to King's Landing is the extent of Robert Baratheon's anger, not just against Rhaegar, which he could perhaps understand. It was misguided, but he could understand, but against everybody associated with the Targaryens, the Targaryen, Rhaegar's children, his wife, and just imagine going through his mind, I suspect will be what happens if Robert finds out that Lyanna, this woman that he thought was his, actually had in his mind betrayed him to Rhaegar. It wasn't just that Rhaegar had kidnapped her, this was actually Lyanna going on with it. And I mm. think that Ned would have thought, you know what, Robert might do that to Lyanna. 
even if he'd not thought that Leanna might have children, which would have just doubled it, then I think that he would have thought that um, uh, this shows that uh, he has actually gone beyond the pale and will start attacking my family if uh, if he finds out the truth. Uh, yeah, definitely. And um, added another layer onto that. I think a lot of people overlook that the Baratheons are Valyrian and they are, they started from Oris Baratheon, the supposed bastard half brother of Aegon the Conqueror. And they recently had Targaryen uh, blood in them from Robert's great grandmother. So when Robert is killing Rhaegar and he's marching on King's Landing and he's condoning the death of Rhaenys and Aegon, he's, re he's killing his own family. And it's not like in an abstract, like, oh, you're, you're killing like a distant relative. They, they are fairly closely related and Robert didn't care. So, yeah, exactly your point. If he's gonna do that to his own family, to his own extended family, like, would he really hold back if one of them had Rhaegar's blood in them? I don't think so. And that's that's um, Ned's gambit, essentially, that his promise that he has to keep John so secret yeah, it's, absolutely. It, this was this was obviously before he knew that John existed. Um, I, I personally think um, because John had probably literally only just been born at that point. Um, but uh, I'm just going to take a, as I always do, sort of halfway through a live stream. Going to take a quick pause, um, guys. I see LML actually is out there in the chat. Hi, LML. Good to see you. Um, and uh, just as I said at the start of this. Um, uh, this stream. Um, guys, I would highly recommend next Wednesday uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, LML, uh, one of my favorite creators uh, here in the community, is going to be uh, on Order of the Green Hands uh, live stream. Another really innovative and in interesting and exciting uh, creator. There are two of them, but creators. Um, uh, and I think that's going to be absolutely fascinating to see that discussion because they've, they've both got lots of ideas which sort of come from outside the mainstream. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So I would highly recommend you tune into that next Wednesday. Wednesday. In terms of stuff that's coming up on this channel, um, as I said, the uh, I will be continuing and finishing my series on Robert's Rebellion and, Rebellion and the Tower of Joy, and I'm also going to be I asked my patrons what they wanted me to do in terms of uh, covering Fire and Blood Part 1, the new George R. R. Martin book, The History of the Targaryens, uh, and they said they wanted me to cover it quite a lot, so there will be a few live streams on it. I'm going to be covering all of the main characters in video form, uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, that's The book is coming out on the 20th of November, so I imagine the next couple of months or so after that will be largely focused on Fire and Blood. If you don't know my second channel, uh, The Well-Told Tale, that's basically me narrating what I consider to be the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever. One episode a week, averaging about 45 minutes of just, just narration. We've done The War of the Worlds, and we are just nearly finishing Frankenstein, which is an astonishingly good story. I'd, I'd forgotten quite how well written it is. So uh, if you're at all interested in that, please do go over and, and check that out. Finally, uh, I just want to say, as I always do, patrons, thank you. I cannot do this without you. Um, I'm going to be focusing a lot more of my time over the coming month or so on my Patreon community, uh, providing additional uh, additional material uh, just for them. So I've got uh, uh, two new audio narrations that will be just for patrons that are going to be coming up this month. Um, if you're at all interested in supporting the channel or getting access to that stuff, please do check out my Patreon page. Link will be down in the description. Uh, but uh, Joe Magician, uh, what's coming up? What, what would you like to plug from your side, things you're doing? Whew, okay. Uh, so I recently did a video on the three witches of Macbeth and how they were transported into A Song of Ice and Fire as long as as well as talking about the three fates from Greek mythology and the Norns from Norse mythology. That was with uh, Shakespeare Thrones. We also did a live stream afterwards on Halloween night with her and San Rixian. Costumes were fantastic. There was a really long good conversation i was really happy with it so you guys should go check that out it's really interesting all the ways that george has taken the idea of witches and kind of like old world gods and made them real especially in characters like melisandre so that one's really good uh coming up soon uh there's going to be some collaborations with gray area coming out 
uh, about night flyers and we're going to talk about the Weimar theory at some point. I think we're doing it at the same time. And Bookshelf Stud and I, uh, my Maester Monthly and A Song of Ice and Fire mod, uh, fellow mod, we're going to be doing a live stream, I think, at some point in the next few weeks where we're going to be talking about um, a lot of people think John's going to come back like he does in the show where he's basically fine, where he's just like, oh, that was weird. All right, I guess I'm John again. We're going to talk about instead, talk about Northern legends like Mad Axe and the thing that came in the night and that John may come back as a vengeful, a murderous kind of person rather than the puppy we all know and love from the show. Oh, and um, I'm going to be at the Fire and Blood event uh, down in Jersey City. Going to be covering that for Watchers on the Wall. Uh, and there should be some live stuff coming from there, too. So that should be a lot of fun. That That's it. That's all. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that all sounds excellent. I have to say, there's um, uh, I, I love it when people start looking at A Song of Ice and Fire through the lens of other bits of literature. Because George R. R. Martin does... Um, uh, lean on them is probably the wrong way of saying mm. it. it's inspiration from huge amounts of different things and we often pick up on the bits of literature that we know very well things like the lord of the rings there are very clear references across to uh, to that uh, and perhaps uh, some of the hp lovecraft stuff uh, but yes he's got this stuff there from from shakespeare about the the the, the witches and things like that that kind of influence uh, how he has written it and i think that that is part of what makes the story resound for us is because there are things that we uh, are a part of the literary canon that has been passed down to us that, that is embedded within there often on many different levels <clears throat> pardon me so uh, yeah i'm really excited by that um we did get a super chat uh, just then uh which was from uh, b1 merry thank you so much 15 dollars is very kind um oh. love to hear uh, both your thoughts uh, did robert know about john uh, this is based on his statement about a king hiding in the snow. Uh, so this is, um, uh, so my, well, my short answer is no, I don't think he did. Uh, but the reference there is, uh, and this is why I'm, I, I have people on here who are far more knowledgeable than me, because I'm, if I had someone like Alamel, he would probably immediately pull up the quote. Uh, but it's in, <laughs> it's in book one, uh, and, uh, Ned and Robert are talking and there's this kind of offhand comment um, uh, about Ned saying, where are the kings? And Robert says, oh, they're under the snows. Uh, um, uh, so I think that was just a, a nod for the reader rather than Robert Baratheon hinting that he knew that there was there was a bastard Targaryen up there. If he knew there was a bastard Targaryen up there, I do not think that he would just be making little uh, subtle references to it and things like that. I think he would have actually done something about it, something quite dangerous and bloody. But uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think the idea of Robert being subtle is one that is just hilarious to me that like he would that he would be like dropping in these little jokes to Ned like eh, I know about John it's fine though and I actually did pull an LML right here and I did pull up the quote it's um from a Game of Thrones Eddard one likely they were too shy to come out Ned just said wow Ned made a joke that doesn't happen too often he could feel the chill coming up the stairs a cold breath from deep within the earth kings are a rare sight in the north Robert snorted more likely they were hiding under the snow snow Ned Oh, such a bad joke. Ned's was way better. The king put one hand on the wall to steady himself as they descended. So yeah, I think that's um, like you're saying, that would be more of a writer's hint than anything. I don't think if there's any chance Robert knew um, that Ned may have been very nervous about that. He may have been like, oh no, is Robert coming up here with the entire court? Because maybe somebody figured it out. Maybe Varys pieced it together. But I, I don't think there's any chance that Robert is subtle or intuitive enough to actually figure that that mystery. I, I would agree completely. Yeah, it's um, it's not really his style. And if he did know, then he would have done something about it. He wasn't the kind of person to uh, tread lightly around a subject. He would have just gone straight into it. Um, just uh, when we're... Um, so Brian Price, um, I don't know whether this was a tongue-in-cheek uh, one of my patrons, tongue-in-cheek question or not, uh, asking, the actor who played young Ned last season was really attractive. Please comment. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, 
I didn't get a picture. Hang on. Uh, but yes, I could see that there was certainly a, a, a bit of a rugged charm to him. Did you have anything you wish to add on that one? I would say um, his face is too square. It, it's it's <laughs> it's it's got very <laughs> sharp <laughs> angles <laughs> around it, whereas Sean Bean has a much more um, natural look to his face. The classic handsome looks of air, of um <laughs> of Sean Bean. Yeah. <laughs> Young Ned is looks like him, the man. It has to be said, was a ruggedly handsome man. Oh, you ever seen him in, um, uh, in either Sharp, which I would highly recommend watching just for the sake of watching Sharp, um, uh, or, or something like Lady Chatterley's Lover, which was a BBC drama a long time ago. Then, uh, then yes, he certainly had it going on in his younger days. Um, uh, but as I say, I think that was probably slightly more tongue-in-cheek question. Uh, <laughs> CDW was saying, um, "Hi, Robert. I always wondered why Ned and Robert never met." in the uh, nine years question mark after Robert became king. Do you see any convincing political plot line or personal reasons for this? Um, well, just in terms of the timeline there, what we're looking at is uh, actually uh, two blocks of time. So uh, we get Ned comes back up from the Tower of Joy with uh, A, a baby, and B, um, the bones or, of Liana, so effectively news of Liana's death, and that's the point at which we hear that they, uh, that Robert and Ned, um, they make up, uh, as it were, so they get back to be friends again. They both mourn over Liana's death, and Robert and uh, Ned goes back up north. Then we have two blocks of time. The first block of time is quite a short one, off the top of my head. I think it's about five years, and then you get the Greyjoy Rebellion, uh, mm. at which point. Uh, Balon Greyjoy rebels, Robert Baratheon crushes that rebellion, and Ned is also there. So we get this um, uh, the meeting of them there, and then you get this longer gap, which I think is the nine-year gap, uh, give or take a year, uh, before Robert Baratheon heads north, uh, which is what we see in book one and uh, season one. So in terms of why there are those gaps, um, I think it's uh, the what we see as being the, the two of them making up, the two of them becoming friends again. I think as much as anything else is uh, Ned actually suddenly realizing that he, he can't be enemies with the king. He, mm. that's just, uh, it would not work. Now everything he is about is about his family. He needs to rule the north, and he's got John that he needs to protect. And he cannot possibly anger the king in any way. What his plan has to be is to get north as quickly as possible with baby John before anyone figures out anything's going on, uh, and then just uh, build up quietly there. So I think he was deliberately staying up up north, and that is why they were staying apart. I think that yes, they might have re reached some kind of rapprochement, uh, but they weren't ever going to go back to where they were before. So that's my reading of it. Um, I think he deliberately distanced himself, but did what he had to do to make sure that, that Robert Baratheon didn't suspect anything. I would agree with much of that. Um, it, Ned probably lived in fear as he was after he got J uh, John from the Tower of Joy. Like John, uh, he probably was born with maybe like dark hair, but what if he came out blonde and it turned black later? Oh God, if anybody figures that out, everyone will put it together right away. Oh, this is a Targaryen kid. And like uh, John's eyes are very dark, a dark gray, but in some lights they almost look a little purplish. So just like from a hiding John perspective, he has to get away from Robert as fast as he can. And the other problem is that uh, Ned's story about what how he acquired Jon Snow is really flimsy. Um, you do not want people like Littlefinger and Varys and Tywin sniffing around, asking questions, like poking holes in his story. Because we see what happens up in Winterfell when someone asks Ned, well, uh, it's Catelyn. She asks him about a Shard Dane, and he essentially goes like, never ask me about Jon, and then goes around and essentially tells everyone to shut up. That doesn't work in King's Landing. It works in Winterfell, but not anywhere else. So if he's really trying to hide these things, it, it, he cannot stay anywhere near court. Those people are too smart. They will figure it out. Uh, also, like we were talking about with, with the slaying of the Targaryen children, I mean, that was that's a big problem with their relationship. Ned is truly about the pack and his children in the future and making sure that as many like children and innocents are safe as they can and justice and all these things. And Robert 
really showed in that moment that he didn't care about those things. He's about Robert Baratheon. And that that could really that really could have just been like a schism between them that even if he didn't have Jon Snow, I'm not sure Ned he probably does the same thing where he doesn't want any part of that guy anymore. Because when they come back and they see each other again, I mean, there's a lot of like, hey, like you're seeing an old friend from high school kind of thing, but there's clearly a distance between them that goes beyond just Ned's trying to hide a Targaryen prince. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It's, um, I think there are, the, the relationship was broken at the point that he saw those dead bodies and uh they may have patched it up a bit and then there will always be this hey we were great friends in the eerie kind of thing but i don't think that they ever got back there as much as ned might have pretended uh i don't think they were ever going to go back there um nine nickels uh thank you so much for the super chat uh during the fight on the trident so we're going back a little bit in time now uh during the fight on the trident do you think Rhaegar told Robert that Lyanna didn't love him and they were and they were in love, boosting Robert's strength in anger? Um, hmm. I no is my first instinct. I, I mean, I think that we're we're told that that he died, Rhaegar died with a woman's name on his lips, and the implication is that this was Lyanna. Uh, but this was um, this was in the middle of a battle a heated battle thousands tens of thousands of soldiers on each side um there's uh sounds of warfare everywhere you get the splashing of the horses and in the the the, uh, the river um they've got huge metal helmets on um they are not gonna stop and have a little chat about what's going on <laughs> Um, I, I don't mean that to sound facetious that that's you in that situation you cannot give information to somebody else. You can't say, by the way, even hurling abuse at somebody doesn't really work that very well. This is why the communication in warfare at the time, it was with bugles and things like that. It was like huge drums to, so that people could hear over the sounds of battle to sort of say retreat or, or advance, whatever. Um, so I don't think he did. I think that Rhaegar was overly confident in that battle with his own abilities and i suspect and i shall get onto this in probably my next video um i suspect also with a, a misunderstanding and this is rhaegar he misunderstands every prophecy a misunderstanding of <laughs> yeah in it um i think that he felt that it was an ironclad certainty that he would survive uh, uh he says stuff to jamie before the battle that implies that he just thinks you yeah, well, i'm just going to go there i'll win the battle and then i'll carry on doing these other things so i think that he was overly confident and i think as we mentioned earlier robert baratheon was an absolute beast an unstoppable uh, fighter at, at that particular moment in time so i don't think he needed the extra anger to get him going i think he was pretty angry already is there anything uh, you'd add to that um I, I it was it's in the world of ice and fire companion app that i that uh Rhaegar did actually say Lyanna's name. But yeah, I, I agree. I don't think a lot of that animosity was really from Rob, Robert's side, especially if the theories are correct or the show is correct that Rhaegar and Lyanna ran away together. Like he might have gotten, at that point, it's clear that Robert is furious at him, but I don't think there's any animosity going both ways. He didn't do that to piss off the Storm Lord, basically. Um, and you're exactly right. I think <laughs> Rhaegar's fatal flaw is much like Aemon and those before him, he got literally everything wrong. It, it's very hard to get these things right. Almost nobody does. That's sort of the point in George's world. It's like the poison chalice idea. By trying to follow those kind of things, you sort of doom yourself. Rhaegar, he, he may have even seen a version of, actually there was a dream Daenerys had where she thought she was Rhaegar on top of dragons roasting um, like beings of ice or something at the Trident. Maybe Rhaegar saw that in his dragon dreams too, if he had any, that kind of thing. Um, there's also one interesting point that I've always loved about Rhaegar's character is that he probably was not a very good warrior to begin with. He got started very, very late. He was a bookworm for most of his life. And then he read the thing in his scroll. He's like, I have to become a warrior. But that was fairly late. Most of the people that are great warriors have been doing it since they were extremely young like Robert, basically. And uh, Barristan, there's a hint in his 
POV that he threw um, the joust with Rhaegar, or that maybe he didn't try as hard because it's the prince. So he could have gotten a lot of a lot of his his battle prowess comes from these tournaments. He's the crown prince. You don't ride against the crown prince. We see that in Duncan Egg, that kind of thing. Yeah, and it's like it's mentioned on on the show. I can't remember if it's in the books as well. Uh, with with um, uh, Ned when he's talking to Robert Baratheon uh, a, a lot later in the the turning of the hand, and he's saying, you know, that people won't fight properly against you, and this is part of yeah. his argument against why he shouldn't be part of the tourney is that you're the king. Nobody's going to want to kill the king, um, and so yeah, I agree. That there is certainly there's a hint that uh, Rhaegar will have had a, a slightly easier go of it um, in the, the, the tourneys. And again, it was Duncan Egg stories. It, it comes through again and again and again. Who wants to actually fight against one of the Targaryens in, in, in a tourney? Because you'll want to lose, won't you? Uh, so um, I think that he would have been overconfident because yeah. of that. Um, and certainly when you see the people that Rhaegar fought or jousted against in the tourney at Harren Hall. One of them was Sir Barristan, and as you mm -hmm. say, there's a hint that he didn't uh, perhaps, or perhaps he threw it. That it. Another one was Arthur Dane, who was his Keith best Gar friend, um, and, and it's a big part of his plans there. Um, and, and then the others were competent fighters, but we don't hear that they're particularly outstanding. So it's, there's a good chance that he overestimated his own abilities. Which would be um, typical Rhaegar. Uh, well, ab absolutely. And uh, th this is the thing we uh, we have to remember about Rhaegar, is that he may well have been a good and noble person, but he was wrong on almost everything that he was convinced <laughs> he was right about. Um, <laughs> going to uh, questions from... And I think, actually, we'll move forward a little bit in time now uh, to when Ned comes back to King's Landing. Um, and... Uh, Brian Price, uh, one of my patrons, asks, why did Ned want to protect Danny, other than his disdain for violence to children? Could she be connected to the Tower of Joy era mystery? So um, uh, I, I think, I mean, I'll throw this one again to you. I've, I've sort of, I, I think, partly answered this by or what I think the answer is to this by saying all of this has to be seen in relation to what happened before in the in in between the two of them. So uh, the the setup here is that uh, you, it, they showed it really well. I thought on on the show uh, as a sort of a set piece thing uh, where Robert Baratheon hears that Danny is pregnant and says, "Right, that's it. We're going to send assassins after her." And uh, Ned just says, uh, no, I'm not going to do it. And he quits. Um, and uh, that, uh, I think, comes, uh, although actually, sorry, I should just say as a point of reference, that Robert Baratheon did want to send assassins after Danny and Viserys way back in the day, but John Arryn had persuaded him not to. Uh, so then when John Arryn was out of the way, then... and. Robert Baratheon had a new excuse. That was when he went to it. So, uh, what what do you think? My my take is that this is just a continuation of this same thought process that Ned had earlier on. Yeah, um, this is referencing the Tower of Joy baby swap ideas, or sort of the alternative baby algebra things that come up all the time. Um, I, I don't think it has anything to do with protecting, like. Uh, usually this theory is like he's protecting his family in a secret way that he secretly knows Daenerys is actually a Stark or something weird like that. I, I think you're, I think you're right on the money that he's, he's not protected. He's not protecting Daenerys um, in particular, or especially he protects all children. That's sort of his thing, but I, especially John's on his mind that this is the argument that would have happened. Had he ever told Rob, Robert about Rhaegar and Lyanna. That's basically it. And and then Ned quits because he's essentially saying, like, my family and my sister and my promises are more important than your friendship, Robert. And that's sort of their their breaking point. Yeah, exactly. So so I see this is just exactly the same. They, they had the argument when there were the, the dead children there way back in the sack, sack of King's Landing and 
Ned storms off and then we get the echo of it again here. He was wanting to storm off. He gets his people packing their stuff and it's only really Littlefinger, uh, his machinations that keeps him in King's Landing for long enough for the whole nonsense to go down. So, um, uh, yes, I think that this was just a continuation of what was happening. We had a couple of uh, super chats that, uh, thank you so much, Mazamonte. Uh, I got your questions on Patreon as well. We'll come to them in just one second. Um, uh, this is a this is a fun question. Could Arthur Dane have been a match for Robert? Um, I think quite possibly. I think they would be very different fighters. Um, I think we don't know because we uh, obviously never saw the two of them in combat with each other. The way that he is described, particularly by Jamie, is of a kind of an otherworldly fighter who could take on uh, uh, five people at once just with his left hand. Um, uh, and Robert Baratheon, although I've been bigging, up, bigging him up, uh, he didn't escape unscathed from all those battles he had. He, on two or more occasions, he got wounded and had to mm. recuperate for a bit so he wasn't it wasn't that nobody laid a glove on him or laid a sword on him he was actually hurt so i think yeah there's a chance uh that he could have done what, what would you think on that well don gives arthur dane an advantage that nobody else has george has gotten the question before who is the best fighter in westeros and he's like eh, or from the current timeline he usually says barrison or arthur dane arthur dane because arthur dane is don so if you Robert Baratheon's alive at the current time, but Robert's kind of fat and out of shape, so maybe not. Yeah, I, I'd probably just go Arthur Dane, just because uh, a Warhammer is very unwieldy, and it's especially good against people that are not good at moving very well, because it's so big and clumsy. Arthur Dane being an expert swordsman means his footwork is probably excellent, so he could probably dodge, much like Oberyn did with the mountain, wear him down, and then just slice him with Dawn, and it's over. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree. I think that the, the issue is just avoid the Warhammer. If one hit comes in the Warhammer, then that would be uh, almost game over, I would have thought. But mm -hmm. if you can avoid it, then uh, then he's uh, home and dry. Um, uh, zoom Zoom, uh, $10. Thank you so much. Hi, LML. Uh, wish you could join in the fun debate. Miss your take on things. Well, uh, he's there <laughs> in the chat, uh, and he was here last week, and he will be back on again some point soon. So don't don't you worry about that. I do I do love having LML on here, uh, even though last time he kept us talking for three hours. Uh, I promise you, uh, we're not going to go that long this time. Um, uh, Sanrixian, fifteen dollars. Uh, just oh, fiery. That's incredibly kind. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, got a couple more questions from my uh, patrons. Um, uh, Mary Montgomery, I said that I'd got your question from Patreon, saying, on his deathbed, uh, Robert asked Ned to take care of his children. Uh, Ned thought he could not bring himself to lie. Then he remembered the bastards, thinking of them specifically Ned made the promise question would ned have told him the truth if there were no bastards what would have happened um so uh so what what do you think on that one joe just in terms of sort of the the bigger picture there what do you think was going through ned's mind in that uh that time when uh robert's uh, effectively trying to say yeah, you you run things for a bit what what's what do you think's going through his mind <sighs> I think uh, I think Ned instantly is thinking of all the <laughs> many women that Robert has left children with all over the kingdoms, all the bad decisions, all his impulse problems, and it's kind of like, how do you control the like? He's the storm lord. He creates a storm around him. He, Robert's thing is always about creating basically chaos and fun and revelry, and just trying to manage somebody like that just couldn't have been easy. Especially like John Aaron did it pretty well just because he's a very mellow guy, I guess. But Ned is also extremely schooled in history. A lot of the knowledge that his children display is from him sitting around the fire, just sort of telling them stories, telling them about the black fire, telling them about Aegon and sisters. So he would be aware of the many, many <laughs> threats that these far flung bastards of Roberts throughout the kingdoms represent, especially someone like Edric Storm and um, Mia Stone, Maya. I forget. I think it's Maya Stone, Mia Stone, whichever one. Uh, even she represents a, a some like 
another complication to the future. I don't know. It, it's I can't imagine it was easy handling Robert when he was young, and he's just like impossible when we see him. Yeah, I I, I think that's true. It's it was a. Uh, um... I, th I think that that point Ned was also he was very much focused in on what is the right thing to do mm. in terms of making sure that succession is right. He realizes that this is uh, a, a horrible situation. Uh, he realizes that uh, the Lannisters are going to take control. He's not stupid. We often think of Ned as being uh, not understanding a political situation. He understood that he couldn't trust Littlefinger and Varys and, and everyone else, and he understood that the Lannisters were just going to go for a big power grab. Uh, so he got all of that. Uh, but I think he was trying to do the right thing in that situation, and I think... Uh, the sensible thing, which he was where he was going, was try to get the Baratheons, the other Baratheons, on side. And I think a large part of his undoing was the fact that Renly and Stannis weren't united. They yeah. split up. If they'd stayed around uh, and stuck by him and uh, and brought their forces in, who are right next door, uh, then that would have probably made it quite a big difference to what was going on. Um, I saw LML uh, just mentioned in the chat uh, off the back of the last super chat, uh, saying that he's trying to get me onto uh, between two weirwoods. Uh, and <laughs> I think both of us. Uh, I was you, uh, you as well. Excellent. Um, the magic uh, one, right? You're in that epic group chat where we're all yeah. uh, disagreeing on dates. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, yes, we're, we're we're. I'm actually uh, hopefully going to be coming on to be between two weirwoods at some point within the next month or so uh joe magician as well and another couple of uh, uh very exciting guests i have to say uh, looking at, at the list of people that are being invited there uh so um uh hopefully uh, that will be quite soon there are a couple of ones that i'm i'm wanting to go onto his channel to do as well as well as i said get him back on here um kathy stark ten dollars thank you so much uh loving this uh collaboration uh are those some horny goats i can see i think they probably <laughs> are. uh fantastic so thank you so much for uh for that uh i keep on thinking perhaps i need to explain horny goats to people but um uh, i think enough people now understand them to to know what's going on uh kelly lousman ten dollars thank you so much uh blood raven oh i love blood raven questions mm -hmm. um, without a robert pov chapter what are the chances blood raven was sending him dreams about children being his downfall <laughs> um i i think uh, you you probably know if you watch this channel a lot. One of my default positions, if in doubt, blame Blood Raven. Uh, <laughs> but I think here, I don't think he needs to do much with Robert Baratheon. You know, I think that he he knew what was going on. I think that he knew what Robert Baratheon was about, and I don't think it affected his plans. His plans uh, were about getting uh, the the right people. Uh, in the right places, and those right people were Bran and John, and that's what he was trying to do when he was trying to affect the Targaryen bloodline. It actually, yes, it would have been probably disrupted his plans not to have the Targaryens in power, but nonetheless, he managed to get John up to the war where he wanted him to be, and he managed to get Bran up to him where he wanted him to be. I don't think he cared actually that much about Robert Baratheon. Um, but what would what would your thoughts be? On that? Uh, Bloodraven is singularly one of my favorite and least favorite topics just for this reason where he's basically a mystery box in the story where you can go all the way from he's he's behind everything he's been organizing all of history to be what he wants to he's kind of failing at what he's trying to do um in this case I don't I don't know if we've in, in his dreams, Robert says he's killing Rhaegar every night. That doesn't seem to have anything to do with children. That's the only dream we really hear about, so probably not. And that's and Robert is technically a Targaryen by blood, but I don't think there's any hint that he's gotten dragon dreams, which I don't even think are from Blood Raven to begin with. So, yeah, and and one of my grand Blood Raven conspiracies is is about his eugenics approach to the Targaryens to try yeah. and make sure that they're uh, they've got uh, the um, Blackwood blood in there as well as having the Targaryen blood so that uh, the, the the person who inherits there has got um, the 
magic of the old gods as well as the Targaryen magic, and I think that that is a thing that he's doing. So I, I would say that Robert Baratheon is outside of that line, and therefore um, I don't think he's who he's wanting. John, however, is very much within that line. Incidentally, Danny is as well. Uh, mm. She, We think of her as being this pure... Targaryen, uh, but actually, if you look back at her her heritage, she's fifty uh, percent um, uh, Blackwood, something like twelve and a half percent Dane or something. I can't remember. There's there's a whole load of other stuff in there that she's not as uh, purely Targaryen as we might initially think, and that is because of the um, the fact that the Targaryen family tree quite often. Uh, resembles a tree uh, <laughs> so um uh, that's that's what's going on there um anime lover uh nicole uh five uh, euros 50 thank you so much why would uh, bobby b let the lannisters take over when ned quit um good question i i think that uh he was um he was actually wanting Ned to be in control again. I think that he viewed there, and and this is perhaps something I'd want to come on to him in a moment. We we've been talking a lot about Ned's perspective of their relationship, but what Robert's perspective of their relationship is probably slightly different. But I think that that Robert was very much wanting to be of the view that Ned would um, uh, would remain hand of the king. Um, we kind of forget the timing here, but just after that uh, Ned storming out thing, Robert Baratheon goes off on his boar hunt. So mm -hmm. he's away there, and I suspect he thinks he's going to come back and he's just going to say to Ned, come on, you can do this, you can take over. And it's not that he's sort of said, okay, Lannisters, now you're in charge, you can do what you want. Um, he didn't invite Tywin Lannister to come in and be Hand of the King. He didn't do anything like that. He, I think he was still banking on Ned being uh, being there for him because he did view them as being so close. Um, what, what, what do you reckon? What, what, what do you think was going through his head at that time? Um, Robert is extremely paranoid when we meet him, uh, much more than when he was when he was younger. He's actually starting to resemble the Mad King, and sort of like he sees daggers in the dark. He sees Targaryen loyalists waiting to ways that waiting to waiting to raise their banners. He wants to go kill Daenerys and Viserys for that. And that's probably not because he's really scared of the Targaryens. He's probably more scared of Tywin and the Lannisters and how he's surrounded by them. So it's not, I don't think he's willingly let Tywin do anything. I think he knows that Tywin just has him by the, has him by the back of the neck. He, he owes all this money to Tywin and the Iron Bank. Tywin is the most powerful man in Westeros. That's not Robert Baratheon. So I mean, what are you going to do? What what can he do? I mean, his one attempt is basically hoping that Ned would pull a Cregan Stark in Hour of the Wolf it, and it doesn't seem to have happened. No, I, I think that's uh, that's very true. Um, I don't. I, I think that he didn't like the Lannisters being there and being in control, but I think that he ha accepted the political reality of it and uh, I, I don't think he really saw all of the um, depth of the treachery that was going on but I don't think that he wanted to see all of the depth of the treachery that was going on he was actually quite happy happy is probably the wrong word I think that his descent uh, long descent happened started from news of Liana's death but down into drunkenness most of the time uh, and and I think that that actually was just in a way we should probably feel a bit sorry for him uh, because uh, regardless of whether or not his love for Liana was requited it clearly wasn't um, the person that he loved was gone and he seems to have not recovered from that in a decade and a half and that's quite tragic uh, mm. so uh, yeah uh, He's not a sympathetic character, but he is a human. And I think that George R. R. Martin doesn't just write two-dimensional characters. We have to accept that there's a part of him that is perhaps quite a sad part that we have to reflect on. Um, Kathy Snow, $10. Thank you so much. No question there, but that's incredibly kind of you. Um, a couple more questions from... Mm -hmm. Uh, my patrons, uh, before we start to wind this one up. Um, Mary Montgomery asked a question which kind of uh, 
is the question that I was uh, trying to articulate a moment ago. Uh, she asked, is Robert a, really a true friend to Ned? And uh, I'm going to sort of reframe that a little bit to, uh, we've seen Ned's journey here. We've seen that perhaps he, he had strong feelings to start with for Robert, uh, and then bit by bit over time, uh, that seems to go away. Uh, he saw who Robert truly was. There was the huge problem with what was going on with Liana that he suddenly realized that this was a huge mistake, the issue with the children, the, 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 the dead Targaryens. And by the end of it, although there was probably still the remnants of that previous relationship, I don't think that Ned was as felt as strongly about the friendship as he previously did. What about Robert's side of this? Do mm. you think Robert still held to the end that they were more than brothers? Do you think that his friendship with Ned also took a bit of a nosedive? I would say probably on some level, Robert knew that that his friend has went back to the North and stayed there for most of 15 years is not a good sign. Like he's not that stupid. He probably recognized that and he remembers their arguments. But when we meet Robert Baratheon in a game of Thrones, he is a man that is living entirely in the past. He, he like his, like we talked about with his dreams where he's killing Rhaegar every night. He talks about Lyanna. There's the plot by Renly to try and replace Cersei with Marjorie Tyrell. And he's asking, does she look like Lyanna? So I think in Robert's conscious mind, He's probably thinking all the time about the great times in the Vale and um, and Mia Stone and all the tournaments and all that stuff. And he's remembering that part of Ned, but much like is his problem with the rest of his life, I don't think he can he conceptualizes Ned as a person. He probably just remembers him as Robert's friend, not Ned Stark, that kind of thing. I, I think I'd agree. There was a there was a good comment in the chat just as you were saying that. Uh, from Igreet Weirwood saying, the more vipers around Robert, the more he valued Ned. And I think that that's, that's very true. I think that he needed uh, somebody that he could trust from his past, from before he was king. This is why John Arryn was his hand of the king for so very long. He knew that he could trust him. He respected him. When John Arryn was gone, he wanted somebody else that he knew he could trust. He could have picked Tywin. He could have picked yeah. Varys, Stannis, Stannis anybody like that. But instinctively, he knew that he couldn't trust them. And I think that the people that he knew and understood were the people from his youth, which were John Arryn and Ned Stark. And he knew that Ned would not be working to undermine him. He would be doing what he considered to be the honourable thing. So um, that, I think, was what was going on there. And, the, yeah, the more, the longer he was in King's Landing, the more he needed that um, as a part of, uh, of his own um, self-protection network as much as anything else. He didn't actually have that many other people around him who um cared about him he had thoros of mir as a drinking buddy um <laughs> but beyond that i suspect there weren't all that many people who actually liked him for who he was i think that's true it, roberts was probably the kind of guy who had a thousand acquaintances and not that many actual friends he should have made stannis and renly his friends he should have promoted them he gave renly master of laws stannis was master of ships because he won the battle against the uh the ironborn but like promote them higher <laughs> do more with them they're your brothers and that that's sort of the genesis of the rift between the three brothers is that robert was not valuing them as much he was he was putting tywin and john aaron above his own kin and i i mean we know from stannis's example that stannis noticed and renly probably did too yeah, and I think to, to sort of bring us back to a starting point here with Stannis. So Stannis, uh, so Ned reminded Robert of Stannis, and yeah. Stannis probably would have been the same sort of character to have as a Hand of the King. Stannis would have done his duty in the same way that Ned did his duty. He might not like it or agree with it, but he would do what he felt he ought to do. And if the king asked him to be Hand of the King, then he would do that. And so I think that actually... Um, uh, he would have been a very good choice as well. Ned, because uh, Robert had that, that uh, uh, 
longer term relationship with with him um which is kind of ironic when you're talking about somebody <laughs> like to say you've got a longer term relationship with somebody else but i think that's that's the truth they had a stronger relationship uh, those two than he did with his brothers um last question from my patrons uh which is from maura lee who gave the uh, the very generous super chat right at the beginning um saying uh, and this is a sort of like one of these what if questions uh, but i thought it'd be quite a fun one to end with how would ned with robert's assistance have defeated the night king and the white walkers would he have done anything different so if if we had a completely different world and uh ned had ned had survived uh and robert had survived uh long enough to know the reality of the White Walkers, and Ned was told about them. Let's 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 be honest. Ned was told about them um, very very early on in the books uh, and in the show, uh, and dismissed it. Um, but if they were presented with uh, evidence of the White Walkers of the others, how would how would they handle it differently? <sighs> okay, that is a big question. Um, well, for one thing. Um... When Stannis charged the wall and John was on top of it, he briefly thought it was Robert. So that's probably a hint that would have been in character for Robert to suddenly show up with an army out of nowhere with no warning. So given the chance to fight against maybe an ancient evil, something that enormous, I imagine Robert would have been extremely happy to have the challenge. Um, I don't know if they win because Robert's victory against the Mad King was largely force of will and that doesn't really work against the magically charged um as for ned what he would have done i don't think it, i think he just would have reinforced the night's watch like i think robert would have wanted to charge he would have gathered like ah it's my my uh, war of the nine penny kings all the lords saddle up we're going after them but ned probably would have been like no nah, it's okay we'll just um we'll get some more volunteers for the night's watch We'll keep the wall up, and I'll be practical about this instead of the off the handle doofus that you can be, Robert. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. That's that, so the the Robert which would have survived would be the Robert that we know, and yes, he would probably um, uh, will have wanted to go on the attack, but also he he's not in personal best shape to be leading nope. the attack. Uh, so. Uh, it pro probably wouldn't have been the best idea. Ned, I think you're entirely right. I think that he would have gone back to the old ways of the Starks. He would have reinforced the wall. He would have got uh, all of the North uh, uh, looking northwards uh, and trying to figure it out. And I think that he would probably have gone back more into the history of what this was to try and understand how the Starks in the past, as defenders of the North, kings of winter what they have done in the past because the north remembers the north <laughs> really has forgotten um and i think that he would known that the north has forgotten and that once he realized that something was going on he would have tried to figure out what on earth it is that he had to be doing because uh he was a person who would do his duty um i'm going to start wrapping up there um i did uh, i do want to give a chance uh, joe could you just have a quick flick through while i'm waffling for a moment could you have a quick flick through the uh, the chats just to see if there's any uh, excellent questions that uh, or, or perhaps one question there that uh, you think it would be a good one to end on so guys this is also obviously your 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 last chance to drop a question in there um but while joe's doing that i will uh, just uh, remind you of the things that are coming up on my channel. Uh, we've got uh, Fire and Blood coming up very soon, uh, 20th of November. Uh, you can pre-order it if you're interested. There's actually there's an Amazon affiliate link down in the description if you're if you're if you haven't pre-ordered it yet. Um, and I will be covering that over the course of the next couple of months. I will be going, probably doing character studies of each of the Targaryen kings or the main issues that come out from that. It's a big tome. We've seen the contents list. It's at least 700 pages long. So it's got, there's a lot of stuff to get your teeth into. There's 100 uh, plus pages just on um, uh, King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne alone. So there's just like, that. that's a short story just there, just on those two characters. So there's going to be a lot going on uh, with that, and I'm going to be focusing two or three live streams on it as well, just to talk through a lot of the issues. So that's that's something to be looking forward to. Um, if you do want to support this channel, uh, 
If you uh, want access to some of the exclusive content I produce for patrons, please do check out my Patreon page. Again, there's a link down there in the description. But Joe, uh, while I was doing that, uh, is there anything you spotted in the chat? Do you think a, a comment or a question that would be good for us to be ending on? Uh, yeah, um, I think this is one. There's there's some other funny ones that I would like that I would love to answer just because I love the topics. But one that's thematic for what we're talking about from oh, oh just briefly the. Uh, the the Robert and Ned fighting the Knights King. I think one thing that would have been very important is which one of them finds Man's Raider first. If Ned finds him, it's probably good. If Robert does, Robert probably kills him, and that probably splinters everything. So Ned finding Mats would probably be the key. Uh, so this question comes from Kate M. Why did Robert wait so long to bring Ned into the fold? He could have been a huge asset to Robert and Aaron in managing the realm. So even though John Aaron was there in charge. Yeah, why? Why Ned was ignoring Robert? Why was Robert ignoring him? Basically, that's a good question. Um, well, I think I think this comes down to something you said in passing, but I think it was it was a really interesting point, which is that I think although um, although uh, Robert might well have still thought that they were very close, subconsciously he will have realised that. Uh, that he did something that made Ned horrified with who he was. And so when Ned went north um, and didn't come back down again for a little trip to say hi for quite a long time, I think he got the message that Ned was just uh, sticking to himself and he wouldn't welcome uh, coming back down. I think that it, it was... Um, uh, Robert had created for himself a setup that worked for him. He was drinking himself to an early grave, it has to be said, but he'd got John Aaron there uh, doing the thing that he wanted to. Um, he'd uh, he'd pardoned Varys, so he knew what was going on in the kingdom. Littlefinger, he got on board, and Littlefinger, let's not forget, he'd made his name over in Gulltown, where he'd suddenly made huge amounts of extra cash by hiking up <laughs> tariffs and things he had this reputation of being this great creator of cash so that he didn't have to worry about robert didn't have to worry about that so i think he felt he created the team that he needed uh, and he could forget about uh, ned until he needed him at the darkest hours so when there was a rebellion he called for ned when mm. John Aaron died, he called for Ned. So it was uh, the kind of thing where he knew that Ned wanted to be left alone, but when he really needed him, he did go calling for him. Mm, I think it makes a lot of sense. And there's also this, the, the thing that Ned is a challenging person and he knew Robert before he was king. Like we see when the uh, Daenerys discussion is coming up, Ned actually makes Robert blush by embarrassing him in front of the rest of the um, the small council. Robert, although he was very obviously deeply depressed, probably in PTSD from the war, he was very happy to ignore everything and to sort of coast with the way things were going. Every once in a while, he'd get involved, but the rest of the time, he's sort of just, just sort of living his life. And Ned would probably make him take things seriously, and that doesn't seem to be the kind of thing Robert was interested in. I, th I think that's fair. Um, actually, while we we're talking, we did get another super chat quickly. B1 Merry, thank you so much. Where are all the Northmen at the wall? Uh, good question. There are some Northmen at the wall, let's not forget. Quite a lot. Um, uh, so uh, the, the ones just that we know about, the sort of the names, Benjamin obviously went up there, um, and uh, Lord Mormont went up there, uh, but there were quite a few others. And so although we don't... Uh, see them all a lot of the, the the wall the people at the wall seem to be a, this kind of combination of people from the north who are going there and then some dregs from the south who get sent up so it's a combination of the two uh there are quite a lot um indeed um we were talking about it before uh but when you think back to uh the, the prologue and the characters you've got going on there it's this combination of first men uh, the voices of first men uh and characters who appear to be northern uh so there there are northerners up there is this is still a place for the northerners to go it's just that what had stopped happening was that the, the brightest and the best weren't going there um uh, in the same regularity that they, they used to be and the numbers of people who were going there have dwindled significantly yeah. 
why they'd moved down from having uh, all the, I forget how many, 17, 19 castles, whatever it was, down to just manning three of them. Um, and there were some in these other places, um uh in 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 east watch uh um uh shadow tower so there are in in these other places and there's a couple of hundred nights watching both of them that we hardly hear about but they are there is there anything you wanted to add on to that um yeah there's there is like you said there is quite a lot of northmen in the watch especially by percentage but like the north is mostly empty there's not that many people like when they ride down to war they bear they barely have like even a percentage of like the amount of troops that High Garden can throw out there or the Western lands can. It's there's not a lot of people. And actually, one of the biggest problems for the Night's Watch, and this is one of my favorite points that George has put into it, is that progress has made the Night's Watch irrelevant. Like there's trade, there's uh there's jobs for people, there's roles for people, there's all these tournaments all over the country, there's cell sword companies, there's there's just so much more for these people to do that you don't have to join the Night's Watch to make a living. That's basically what it was before. It would give you pride and it would give you a place to live and it would give you three squares a day. And if you had no other options, you could go there. There's tons of options now in Westeros and in Essos. And especially the problems um, that, the, that things like the King's Road and the Targaryen stability enforced that m led to the dwindling. It's that the, a lot of the people ended up on the walls were from war, massive wars, wars between kingdoms. Like when Nymeria took over Dorne, she sent something like five or six kings to the wall all at once. That's that's incredible. That doesn't happen anymore. The Targaryens tend to kill their prisoners, and there's not that many massive wars, uh, or actually small ones, happening all the time. So it's unfortunate there's not that many people there anymore, but I imagine the amount of Northmen there pretty similar to what it would have been historically maybe a little less but there just there really aren't many people there no and, that, and that's that's true and the decline wasn't just over the last few years this has been a decline over centuries yeah. it has to be said so uh, uh thank you for that question um guys i'm gonna uh, round it up there i don't think i've missed any super chats uh so um uh, thank you so much uh, I, I found this a fascinating discussion i, I really enjoyed it um uh, but why don't uh, why don't you uh, just uh let people know uh, remind people where where joe joe magician where are you <laughs> where i exist uh, this has been a really fun stream, especially because we started off talking about the possibility that Robert and Ned were gay. I don't think anybody saw that coming from the stream. That's that's what we do for you guys, give you the ridiculous ideas that are entertaining. Uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Joe Magician. Uh, Watchers on the Wall uh, by the same name, Joe Magician. I write feature articles for them, the Maester Monthly Podcast, uh, the A Song of Ice and Fire board on Reddit, on uh, Twitter, at Joe Magician 42 and I have a blog where all these things feed into. So if you just want one place to check everything, you can go to clankingdragon.wordpress.com. Everything is set up to feed to that one place. So you can do it that way if you like. Fantastic. And thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. It's uh, and I can just tell from the uh, uh, the chat how much everyone else has. Uh, I think that's been a fantastic discussion. And thank you for bringing your your knowledge to this. Guys, please do go and check out uh, his channel uh, and subscribe and also go have a look at the clanking dragon. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much to uh, to everyone who did a super chat. Uh, thank you to my patrons for your questions as well. And thank you guys in the chat. Um, we'll be back same time next week uh, with, um, I think I've got Aziz back on from History of Westeros, which would be excellent. I haven't thought of a subject yet, uh, but he's always excellent value. So uh, guys, thank you so much. And I shall see you again this time next week. Take care. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>